Mother's Day. Again, I want to say happy Mother's Day to everyone. I hope you're having a great day. I'm thinking of a few mothers that are up in heaven rejoicing that we're here this morning. But I'm thankful that they're there. And I know they're where they want to be. We still miss them here on earth. So, you know, let's think of those that have recently lost their mothers. Maybe just send them a little text today to know you think about them. And you know, I've had a, I have a, I don't celebrate Mother's Day. I celebrate Mother's Mother's Week. And my kiddos have surprised me with cards. And Jordan wrapped up treasure, her own little treasures for me on Tuesday and put them in a gift bag. He set them out to tempt me, but I didn't peek. She let me open the presents on Wednesday, and then they made me cards at school. It's been great. My husband. Got me a cultivator for my garden. Let me tell you, we're at that point in marriage where appliances and things like that make me very happy. Tell you why? Make the weeding a whole lot easier. Thank you, thank you. And then I had at East Missouri Gardens in kindergarten this year, and they do the little mom spa. Well, Jonathan did that last year, and I don't know if you guys remember, but I got a ticket on the way, or I got stopped on the way there, but no ticket because. I worked late, had a late patient. So this year I just took the Friday morning off and got there and she fixed my hair and it was quite lovely with turquoise and pink sequin headbands in my hair. And it was, it was really nice and she served me cookies and punch and it was great. And you know, even this morning, our Sunday school teachers are awesome. I got a car, I got a, get a cute little gift from Jonathan that Sister Martha had taken photos and I know Rush to put together last week on her own time. Thank you, Sister Martha. And then Sister Cynthia, pictures, little rose. Thank you guys for taking the extra time that you do. Thank you to all of our Sunday school teachers. Y'all are definitely the unfriendly. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Apologize. I had Sister Loopy took care of the gifts, but at ladies' conference with Katie this year, Sister Kim Haynes spoke, and her work, her two messages were so powerful that my plan was to make a copy of both me me talk. messages and give them to you today, but it didn't get downloaded onto the computer in time to the website, so I'm going to try to get those to you later. But one of her sermons was truly amazing, and it will actually go for it. That's why I'm giving them to you. But one of them is called When God Speaks, What God Speaks in Silence. And it is it's really, really ministered to me. And then the other it talks about the heart, which was just amazing because God had already given me a word for this, this, this service, and it, it just kind of confirms some things to me. So I'm going to jump right in and stop rambling. Here we go. Luke 6, 43 through 45. And that's what I'm going to base things off of today. And this just jumped out at me. I know I've read it a thousand, well, lots of times. But when I read it in my devotion this morning, it really just jumped out at me. It says, For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. Or if thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. And then we're going to read Proverbs 4 and 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And the New Living Translation says that this way. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. And I'm going to take that little First phrase, guard your heart, and that's what I want to talk about today. One more, and get your work money's worth of scripture. Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord, 
And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Thank you. You can be seated. So, so Jordan has started piano lessons. She's learning the C scale, the correct fingering from her dad. A couple of weeks ago, we made a quick trip to see my parents, and I was telling mom, you know how we do, we give all the kids accomplishments and talk about things. And I'm telling mom about Jordan to start her piano lessons. And so Jordan, with no piano right there on my mom's end table, starts doing the correct fingering for the C scale. So she's showing Nana how to play the C scale. And when she did that, it prompted a memory of a story I heard. And the year is 1958. Of course, the Cold War is going on. And there's a tall, lanky Texan from Kilport who does something. You know what he does? Okay. Yes, absolutely. Van Fiber won the first international Pachowski food competition in Moscow. And you know, the whole U.S. was proud of that. Tall, lanky Texan who beat the communists at their own competition. Now, a name you may not know would be Luz Shiku. He was the second place winner that first year at that competition. He was a 19-year-old pianist from China. And that win swept him into popularity in China. He became one of their premier performers until 1966. And in 1966, that's when the Cultural Revolution, led by the Gang of Four, swept through China. Western music was totally banned, and thousands of artists and intellectuals were in prison, including Lou. For six years, he's in prison, and he has no piano. Later, he is, he is released. He actually plays when President Nixon goes to China in 1973. And they asked him later, they said, what were you doing those six years alone in a prison cell? He said, I kept practicing music in my head. I even composed a concerto, even though I had no paper to write it down. And I'm going to tell you one more story, and then I promise we'll tie it all together. I read three, actually it's been a couple years ago, I read the book Unbroken by Lauren, Lauren Hillenbrand. They made it into a movie. I haven't seen it. I don't do well with those things. Books upset me. And this book was very intense. When I read Schindler's List, I had to read it very slowly because cruelty, I don't understand it, and it upsets me. But this story was a great, it's a, it's a good read. It's an amazing story. It's the story of Louis Zamperini. Now, Louis was an Italian immigrant son. And he was actually on his way. He was an Olympian, and he was on his way to running a four-minute mile. And then World War II happened, and he was drafted. So we're going to fast forward through the story of his life. And it's May 1943, and he's part of a bomb squad. And I'm apologizing to anyone in the military that I get the terms more wrong right now. Anyways, May 1943, they're stationed in Hawaii. And as fate has it, a B-25 goes down and they need someone to go look for the crew. Well, they said the lieutenant asked for volunteers. Anybody in the military knows what that means. They said, he asked for volunteers, and finally, the crew that Louis, Louis was on, or Louis was on, volunteered. Their pilot was named Phil Phillips, and there were 10 other men that volunteered for the mission. But their plane had been bombed already. They didn't have a plane. And so the lieutenant says, well, you can fly the, in the Green Hornet. And Bill says, well, that plane's not airworthy. 
and the lieutenant says, oh, well, it passed inspection. <laughs> and so off they go. Long story short, all of the engines shut down, fail, whatever the word is that they're further in okay? And they crash into the water. Three people of the 11 survive. We have Louie Zamperini, we have Bill Phillips, the pilot, and another man, Matt, Matt Namira, survived the crash. They have two two-man rafts, several ration D bars, which the, the book says is a high-calorie chocolate that tastes so bad you won't eat it unless you're hungry. A couple of pints of water, a flare gun, some fish hooks, some fishing line, two air pumps, and a set of pliers with a screwdriver built in. Well, they, they assessed that later when they crashed. Amazingly, Louie had a, only a finger cut. Bill was woozy in days from, from a head wound. And so he immediately, being the pilot, he was in charge, but he knew he, he, he needed someone that could think clearly, so he put Louie in charge. And so Louie begins planning their survival. He says they'll eat one piece of chocolate every day, one in the morning, one in the evening. And the author noted that Phil said he felt frightened but not panicked once he put Louie in charge. Meanwhile, the third man, Matt, kept yelling, we're going to die, we're going to die, screaming, screaming, we're going to die, we're going to die, until Louie punches him in the mouth to get him to be quiet. <laughs> After that, the, the author says Matt just kind of withdrew into himself and came over to his catatonic. But he was quiet. That first night, while Phil and Louis slept, Matt ate all the chocolate rations. And I'm telling you that story because the mindset of those three men, three men, same situation, they're facing incredible odds. They're thinking so different. Let me tell you, they watch the next day as the search, plane searching for them flew by and overlooked them. They were harassed. Sharks circled their life raft. The fact it damaged one of their rafts and they end up with one life raft. They're sunburned. They lack adequate food, water, shelter. Mac, like I said, withdrew into himself. It seems he could only see and picture death. And let me tell you, after 33 days at sea, he did die. He passed away. I think he died in his mind a long time before he ever physically died, though. Now, Phil and Louie, on the other hand, they were able to think ahead and focus on other things. They planned for their survival. They caught birds. They caught fish. They stored rainwater. A plane finally did spot them, and it was a Japanese bomber. And it began bomb, trying to bomb them. Thankfully, it missed. They uh, pretended they were dead. But even being bombed by a Japanese plane, Brother Myers, it got them to think. And they began to plan and estimate how far they were from the Marshall Islands. So it seemed every bad thing, they were able to find a good in it. And the fact they were placing bets on how many days it would take them to get from Hawaii to the Marshall Islands, or from where they were. They were saying 46 or 47. Well, at the end it was 46, so Bill was right. But they talked, it said they talked about childhood memories. What do you do all day on the life, on the life route? In circle by shorts. They cooked imaginary meals for each other. They taught each other songs. They quizzed each other. You know, if they told a story again, they make sure they got the details right. They said their memories, instead of fading as their physical body faded and became weak, their memories, their mind became more vivid. And on day 46, like I say, they saw land. Land occupied by the Japanese. And you'll have to read the rest of the story to hear how, how it ends. But let me tell you, I'm not going to tell you the whole story. It was great, though. But let me tell you, they did give credit to God for their survival. But I was fascinated by their mindset, you know, and in the mindset of, of Lou, the pianist. 
What made one man focus on death and the others focus on survival? How did one man withdraw into himself? How does one person face insurmountable odds and come out victorious while the same circumstances destroy another individual? And I'm going to talk about that today because I believe the answer is in this. The heart makes all the difference. It's a matter of the heart. Today I'm going to attempt to ask and answer three questions. What is my heart? How do I guard my heart? And why do I need to guard it? So, question one, what is my heart? What are we talking about? Well, we all know, we've had enough science, we know that it's beating inside of us, it keeps the blood flowing, oxygen and nutrients going to the cells, takes waste away from the cells. And then, you know, sometimes we might say, let's get to the heart of the matter. And there we're talking about the central and part part of an idea. And then my kids love the heart of the of the melon. You know that central, sweet heart of the watermelon. Say amen, Jonathan. <laughs> and you know we even see heart interchanged for the word love. Someone might send you a text. I heart you. You might get that little note when you're in elementary with a heart on it. So. We interchange the heart for we love at times. And some say a heart is just where our emotions take, take place. That we're talking emotions when we say heart. But let me tell you, it was a lot more than emotions that kept Louis Phil going on that life raft. Yeah. So I looked to scripture, and that was the scripture we read, Luke 645. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth that which is evil. For the abundance of the heart is mouth speaking. And then in Proverbs, keep your heart with all diligence. Deuteronomy 6 and 5, love the Lord with all thine heart. So if I'm going to have to guard my heart and I need to love the Lord with all my heart, I really need to know what is, what's my heart. So I looked it up in Hebrew. In the Hebrew, there's two words for heart, actually. There's labob, which does refer just to our inner, you know, our inner organ here. And then there's the word lay, which is derived from that, and it means it's widely used for feelings, the will, and the intellect of a person. I say the mind of a person. So my heart is my intellect, my will, with my feelings. So I need to keep my heart with all diligence. So why do I need to guard it? I think I just answered that. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. You know, how you think about a situation, it's going to direct your whole life. Matthew 15, 18, 18 through 20. Jesus said this, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defiles not a man. So, out of my heart... The course of, or the guard it, my heart determines the course of my life. So that's why I need to guard it because from out of my heart, my mouth speaks. Go ahead. And we're going to talk about putting good things in our heart so that when we do so, good things come out. You know, for a good tree bringeth forth not corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good tree fruit. For every tree is known by his fruit. For our thorns, men do not gather figs. Let's say it this way. Men don't gather figs from thorn trees. And then I put it where we live. You don't get pecans from a Chinese tallow, do you? What I deposit in my heart 
is what I'll be able to withdraw out later. You know, it, and I, I just look at it this way, being a, being a mom. Here we go. We tell our kids, you are what you eat. Now, Jonathan's favorite food is cheese enchiladas. And I jokingly tell him, one day I'm going to go into your bedroom and you're not going to be laying in your bed. There's going to be a giant cheese enchilada with mozzarella sticks for hair, watermelon for mouth and eyes. And I told George, I said, you're going to be a big carrot. That's her favorite vegetable with mozzarella sticks for hair and popsicles for arms and legs. You know, it's true. We are what we eat. I went to some continuing education a year or two ago. It was all on the effects of diabetes on the eye. And I can tell you, the lecturer there, he, well, let's just say, I think he hated soft drink companies. Because he worked in a, he worked in a clinic for, for advanced diabetes for, for patients going blind. And that's all he saw all day long. He was adamantly opposed soft drinks and junk food and he pointed out to us that since the 1950s type 2 diabetes and i'm sure you nurses here will agree will just skyrocket the number i mean it's like exponential growth in diabetes and he attributed it and this was the doctor not me he attributed it to two to really one thing that led to another he said it's processed foods because Moms went to work, and they weren't able to cook as healthy of meals anymore. We didn't have our little gardens in the backyard. And he really, really said that was the cause. What we eat was causing the diabetes. So we truly are what we, we are truly what we eat. And if that applies in the physical, it absolutely applies in the spiritual. Amen. 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 You know, I can remember in VBS. Years ago, we sang this little song. Right when computers were pop, not popular. Oh, I'm dating myself there. We sang, input, output. What goes in must come out. Input, output. That is what it's all about. Input, output. Your mind is a computer whose da input daily you must choose. And it is so true. I need to guard my heart. I've got to watch what goes into my heart. Because what I put into my heart is going to be what comes out. During those times of stress and difficulty, during those times of discouragement, what have I put into my heart to withdraw out later? Always Okay. So, question three. Question three. How do I guard my heart? The answer is easy, but much harder to do. Easily said, but much harder to do. Just as I diligently watch my diet, I need to watch my spiritual diet. What I watch, what I listen to, who I listen to. And I'm not going to go into all the what I watch and what I don't watch and what I listen to. But I wanted to talk about three ways to guard the work on heart. And the first one I would say is just eat good spiritual, healthy spiritual food. Psalms 119 verse 11. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. You can memorize scripture. Not only memorize it, internalize it. Amen. Amen. Say it again. again. Don't just memorize it, internalize it. Let me tell you, when I went to optometry school, I moved from the middle of nowhere, which is Moss Hill, Texas, to Houston. And I gotta tell you, it was country mouse goes to the city. And it, that is the truth. My dad gave me a cute little 22 pistol because I live by myself and I had it under my bed. And also, I realized that really fast I could live or scared to death or I could learn to trust God. Amen. So what I did is I memorized three scriptures. 
And I've taught them, I've taught the first one to my kids already. You can help me out, Jordan? Psalms 56 and 3. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Psalms 4 and 8. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, O Lord, makest me to dwell in safety. Amen. Psalms 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my fortress, my God, and Him will I trust. And after a couple of nights of saying those, as I walked around my house praying, I wasn't scared anymore. I realized a couple of things. Well, most fear is irrational. Yes. And then I also realized that Amen. what are the odds of somebody breaking into my apartment? But also, you know what? If they did, they would either kill me or not. And if I died, I was in heaven. And if I wasn't, I wasn't dead. So why worry? So, but the Word of God, it kept me. And let me tell you, the Word of God will keep you. If you're facing a difficult situation in your life, I don't know, maybe you've got fear of something or anything, whatever it is, look up three scriptures. Memorize them. And when the devil comes at your mind, you can quote those scriptures. When that irrational fear enters your heart and paralyzes you, quote those scriptures. It makes all the difference. So, that's one thing. Now, the other thing is, or the, the, the next way I was going to say, one of the ways is to listen to good reports, positive, positive, uplifting conversation. Philippians 4 and 8. Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. So, Paul there is given us a guideline of things to talk about. You notice there, he didn't mention anything negative. And I got to tell you, at the point where Paul wrote that, he was sitting in a Roman chair at jail. And he could have wrote a woe is me. Here I am. No, he says, I want you to think about true, just, pure, lovely. There's a has a good report. If there's any virtue, if there's any praise, think on those things. Let me tell you, the world we live in is filled with negativity. The news is always looking for a scandal. And on the president. Democrats want to get the Republicans, Republicans want to get the Democrats, and I just turn everything off. Right. I get so tired of it. I don't need to be weighed down all day long about that stuff, you know? And you know, just likewise, I don't want to be weighed down by negative reports all the time. You know, this person said this, that person doing that, everything's bad, nothing's good, enough of that. You know, give me something edifying. Because I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be what I do. And so I'm going to encourage you to listen to encouraging reports. Amen. Surround yourself with people that encourage you. God is good all the time. All the time. Paul, oh, Sister Wadi, let her tell you how God's provided for her. Amen. She's always got something positive to say. Talk to Sister Annie about how God is moving in her family. I've never heard her say anything bad. And so, with that in mind, I thought of a story that Sister Phyllis had told me. You know, I love talking to her because she always uplifts my spirit. Amen. And as I was preparing this, I thought of something she had told me that had absolutely encouraged me. And as I told my husband about it last night, he said, I feel the Holy Ghost. So, I just wanted to give you a... A great example of an encouraging word. Yes. Thank her for helping me out today. Thank you all and thank God for this opportunity. And Sister Bill asked me what I could up here and speak. I couldn't say no because I didn't have this So I'm here and 
She was talking about the heart. The heart's coming. <laughs> you got it, sister. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, the story that I told her was um, when my husband wasn't in church. Um, and every time I would come to church, I would save a spot for him. I would always sit in the door and I would always save the spot for him as if though he was sitting there. And um, I trusted God, and he came She's through. Got me. And I'm going to thank and praise God for that. Also, um, I've always uh, saved a spot for my children, too. Um, they're not here, but I know one day they will. Amen. 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 the spot yeah. on my heart mm. and I know that one day they will be here God. and I want to thank and praise God for that I, that is my vision and I will continue to hold on to that vision so if you have children hold on to that amen because it will come to pass if you trust and you love God it will come to pass Just trust listening to good reports, and then number three is speak positively to yourself. Because Proverbs 23 and 7 says this, As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Now, you can leave it up in, some, in Luke, where, where Jesus was talking about a good man and his good treasure in his heart, that which is good. When I read treasure, I was thinking treasure chests, you know, riches and dreams. But when I looked it up in the, in the Greek, it actually meant deposit. Like daily, I was depositing, like going to your bank and depositing your paycheck, laying up for a rainy day. So it, wasn't, it was something that we do daily. And so, on point three here, as we talk about <coughs> speaking positively to yourself, because as we think in our hearts, so, so are we. Maybe think of another song. What can I say? I'm going to think on the good things. Think on what the Lord has done for me. I'm going to think on the good things because what I think is what I'm going to be. So, let me ask you a question. Do you see the glass as half full or half empty? I had heard that a positive attitude or being optimistic can affect a person's health. So I just quickly Googled the other day, optimistic and good health. And there actually were three prominent, prominent research facilities that have recently published reports on that. John Hopkins, Harvard Medical School, and the Mayo, Mayo Clinic. And they had what they said, one study actually said this. They looked at patients that had, had heart angioplasties. And they found that pessimists were three times more likely to have a heart attack and require re repeat angioplasties over optimists. Another study showed that optimists were less likely to have high blood pressure, more likely to have overall good health, and were less likely to catch the common cold. They hypothesized that a positive outlook boosted the immune system by decreasing inflammation. Now the doctors in the study were quick to point out that positive people were not Pollyanna's playing the glad game where they buried their hands in the sand and ignored everything negative going on around them. Rather, they were people that did not dwell on failures. They used them as learning experiences. They chose to see the good in a situation. In contrast, negative people filtered out all the good things that happened in a day and focused 
only on the negative. Sorry? Absolutely. <laughs> now you see why they were negative, right? <laughs> oh my goodness. The doctors then suggested ways to become a positive thinker, and I'm not here to do a little psychology on you, but what they said was number one, identify areas that you need to change. And this is true for anything. Check yourself throughout the day. Am I thinking negatively? Three, surround yourself with positive people. We talked about good reports. And then number four, practice positive self-talk. I do talk to myself. Do I, I actually answer sometimes. Oh no. But remember, Proverbs 23 and 7. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You know, David, when his family at, at the brook at Ziklag, when everyone, his family, his children, everything had been taken captive by the Amalekites. Remember that? His, his fellow soldier wanted to serve him, to stone him. David encouraged himself in the Lord. And so, sometimes you're just going to have to talk to yourself. In fact, Sister could put up Psalms 43 and 5. I thought this was a great example of David talking to himself in Psalms. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. For I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance, and my God. Yes, so it's okay to talk to yourself sometimes. And now, let me tell you. Practice positive self-talk. Don't say anything to yourself that you wouldn't say to other people. Okay? Let me tell you. My kids, and I know kids do it. Jordan, when she makes, she makes, makes a mistake, she'll say, I'm so dumb. And I told her, I said, don't talk to my daughter that way. And she's laughing, she looked at me like I was crazy. And laughed at me, she said, but I am your daughter. And I said, I know. And I don't let anyone talk to my daughter that way. Not even my daughter. Amen. There are some of us who would never talk to the others the way we talk to ourselves. Mm. That inner voice that tells us what a failure we are. That we've blown it. That we've messed up again. That we're not smart enough. That God is finished with us. That God can never use us. That we fell one time too many. Some of you out there know what I'm talking about. God, I am such a failure. God, I am so. And you fill in the blank. I felt this strongly in prayer. In fact, God would not let me sleep one Wednesday night until I listened to him and wrote this down. He wants me to tell you. God wants me to tell you this when I got done. He wants you to stop talking about his child that way. You're his child. He does not want you talking about his children that way. He loves you. He forgave you. You
to be in here. And ladies, I'm going to ask you to stand. Actually, I'm asking everybody to stand. And ladies, I'm going to just ask you to come up front. We're not going to, we're not going to linger long. We're just going to worship together for a minute. We're going to let God talk.